Right, so today we want to continue with a very important aspect of the um, of the exam, you know, and that has to do with the topic of ecology, you know, the food chain. Something about the, we talk about the food chain. We we'll talk about interaction between uh, the feeding, uh, different type of feeding relationships, you know, and the food web and so on. It's a very important topic. Again, once you know the concept, you can answer any questions given to you based on the diagram that is given to you if you understand the various concepts I'm going to talk about. You're going to see how easy it is to apply it. So, for, so some few terms that we have to know before we can answer questions. So I'll begin by defining what ecology is about. So basically, ecology is a study of the interactions of living things with each other in their physical environment, right? So we're talking about interactions here, living things with each other in their physical environment, okay? So the living things on Earth may be organized into four different levels of ecological organizations. Um, these levels are one population. So when we say population, we're talking about members of one species in an area. So let's say that I have population of dogs, right? That's one species. Then I have another population, let's say humans. So that'll be from another population and so on. Cat population, right? Same species. Then talk about the population. Now, Community, this refers to all members of the different interacting species in an area. So it means you put all these populations together, then all this here will form like the community, right, forms the community, okay. Then the ecosystem refers to all the members of the community, plus what we call the abiotic, or the fiscal factors influencing them. So when you take this community here, all the other external factors like temperature, pressure, humidity, if you put all that together, they have what you call the ecosystem. So all this will be like the ecosystem. Okay. So you have the sun, heat from the sun, you have temperature, at, so that would be temperature, for example, let's say temperature. Okay, you have humidity, and so on, pressure. Okay, interacting with the community forms the ecosystem, right? Then we say biosphere. Biophere refers, refers to the entire region of the earth where living things may be found, right? So wherever you find living things on the surface of the earth, we refer to that as the biosphere, the biosphere. Okay, so like biology, living. So those are the four terms that I want you to know when we talk about ecosystem, population, community, ecosystem, and then biosphere. Okay. Now I want to look at the nutritional in interactions. How do the organisms interact with each other in terms of feeding? So nutritional inter inter interactions. So all ecosystems must have three basic kinds of nutritional interactions in order to be stable and self-sustaining. Right, these nutritional interactions involve what we call producers. So you have to know producers, you have to know what we call the consumers and then decomposers. So these are the three interactions, levels of interactions that we have to know of. Producers, consumers and decomposers, all right. So you should be able to identify this in any question given to you, like the food chain or the food web. You should be able to identify these groups of interactions. So let's define what the producers are. 
So when you say a producer, you're talking about an organism that is capable of trapping sunlight. So it can trap sunlight energy to make glucose sugar in the process of photosynthesis. So the key word here is the fact that that organism should be able to undergo the process of photosynthesis, very important, right? So that makes a producer, it can produce its own food. So example of this would be the plants and algae, you know, the, the examples of um, producers. Um, producer, producer organisms are also called the autotrophs. So autotrophs is very important to remember when they ask you which of the following is an autotroph or identify the autotrophs in a given food chain or food web, you should be able to identify them. So producers are the autotroph. Auto means for self. Trough means feeding. So self producing or self feeding, you know. In other words, they can produce their own food from inorganic substances, right? Remember when we talk about photosynthesis, we said that the plants, can, they need carbon dioxide, they need um, water, you know, and, it, and in the presence of sunlight to make their, uh, to make the glucose, right? And the oxygen is given off as a waste product. Okay, so those are the inorganic substances that they need to make their food. Okay, producers. So remember, produce producers. Then the second one is a consumer. So the consumer, we say organisms, consumer organisms depend up, 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 upon and eat other organisms. So they depend on other organisms for their food. Okay, the consumers, so the consumer. In other words, they cannot produce their own food. They can't produce their own food. Okay. So another word for consumer that can be used is a word heterotroph, heterotroph, all right? So heterotroph means that they cannot produce their own food. They need, they rely on other organisms for their food. Um, there are three categories of consumers, consumers. The first one is the herbivore. Herbivore, not from the word herb, you know, so it fits on plant material. So herbivore, plant material. And they have carnivore. Carnivore, as we know, they eat other animals, carnivores. So we carnivore, other animals. Omnivore. Omnivore, uh, omni means like all around, right? Everything. So omnivore. So it's a, cons it's a consumer that eats both plants and animals material, feeds on both plants and animal material, okay? So an example of um, omnivore would be like human uh, human beings, okay? We are like omnivores because we feed on both plants and animals. Uh, carnivores would be like dog, you know? Herbivores like um, cow or goats and so on, okay? So all this will be found on the food chain. If we go to the food chain, you see all these organisms there. And then the third category is the decomposer or the decomposers, right? So the decomposers, a decomposer is a special category of consumer organism, right? The decomposers, they break down. So the key where they break down dead organic matter and change it into simpler nutrients, which can be recycled in the ecosystem, okay? So they break down uh, substances and then they release the nutrients back into the ecosystem, like into the environment or into the soil to be reused. So almost like a recycling. Um, example of this would be bacteria and fungus. Bacteria and fungus would be some examples. Okay. So as I said, you should identify all this on the food chain. Now, the only thing that you cannot find on, is an important member of the food chain, which is not listed on the food chain is the decomposers. So the decomposers here, you don't see it on the food chain, right? So let me write that here. Not shown 
on the food chain. Okay, but they are important members of the food chain. Even though it is not shown on the food chain or the food web, all right? So there are questions like that. So which, which one is an important member of the food chain that is not shown? Then you have to know it decomposes. Okay. All right, great. So with this knowledge, we can now look at the food chain, what the food chain is. So let's look at the concept of the food chain. So the food chain, it's a single chain showing one organism eaten by another, which in turn is eaten up by another organism. So one organism feeds on one another, and then it's in turn being fed upon by another one, right? So it's a representation of organism feeding and being fed upon, right? So the basic food chain begins with the producer. Producer is always the first level, so producer. And then we use the arrow. The arrow means that the producer is producing food for the, the primary consumer, the first level of consumption, right? The first organism to feed on the producer is called a primary consumer. Then the next one to feed on the primary called secondary consumer. And they have tertiary consumer and so on. Okay, that's how it goes. So it's like first level of consumption, second level of consumption, third level, and you can even have quaternary, like going to a fourth level and so on. Okay, quaternary. Oh, these are all different levels. Consumer and so on. Okay. So those are levels of consumption. So producer, primary consumer, secondary, and tertiary. So when I get a food chain, you to identify them in that order. Okay. In other words, we can go backwards. We can say that the primary consumer feeds on the producer, secondary consumer feeds on the primary, and then tertiary feeds on secondary, and quaternary feeds on tertiary, and so on. All right. Okay. So let's look at a typical example of the food chain. Okay, this is an example of food chain. So have grass going to grasshopper and grasshopper providing food for toad, toad providing food for snake and snake providing food for hawk, right? When I given this type of questions, you just follow the arrow, you follow the arrow and then you never go wrong, okay? So here, how do you interpret this? This means grass is eaten by grasshopper. Grasshopper is fed on by toad. Toad is fed on by snake and snake is fed on by hawk. Right, that's how you interpret this, okay? So which one will be the primary um, um, consumer? The primary consumer will be the grasshopper, right? The grasshopper will be the primary consumer. So this is a primary consumer. This one will be secondary and so on. This will be a tertiary and then a quaternary. Okay. So that's how it goes. Okay. Then you also have questions where they will tell you that maybe one particular level is not there. So what happens to the population of the level before or after it? All right. For example, what will happen to the grasshopper population if the toad population goes down? So it means that the toad population here, let's say this is down. What happens to the grasshopper population? 
um, I expect the gas of power population to, you know, to go up based on this chain, right? But if this, the toad is not there, then gas of population will go up because there's no toad to feed on it, you know? And then based on the diagram, if the toad level goes down, then the snake population will go down because the snake will not have any food, right? Based on this diagram. You always answer in terms of the diagram given to you, right? Don't make any assumptions. Just base your knowledge on the diagram given to you, otherwise you go wrong. If you assume, oh, the snake will get food from that basis. Yeah. If the diagram doesn't show that, don't force it there. Yeah. And we'll see questions like that soon. So that is a food chain, a food chain. And then we also have the food web, the food web. So the food web, most animals are part of more than one food chain and eat they eat more than one kind of food in order to meet their food and energy requirements. These interconnected food chains form a food web. So they form a food web. Right. So there are so many food chains put together to form the webs. So let, let's trace some of them. Let's trace some of them here. So let's start with the producer. So I have grass, right? So the grass is producing food for the grasshopper, grasshopper food for toad, toad food for snake, and then snake food for hawk. So this is one path. You can see there's one path here. So yeah, I'm following the arrow. So that's one food chain. I can also have another food chain. Grass produces food for the rabbits, rabbit food for snake, and snake food for the hawk. So that's another path. So second food chain, I see another food chain, producer. So first producer grass, food for the rabbit, and a rabbit produce food for the hawk. So that's another food chain. So I have three, three food chains put together in this, right? That's why it's a food web, food, a food web, right? made up of more than one food chain. You can see organisms, like the snake is getting food from the toad and they're getting food from the rabbits, you know, here and there at the same time, okay, and so on, okay. Hawk is getting food for the snake, getting food for the rabbits, okay. Right, so how do you answer questions based on this? But like just as I asked, what, the same question again, so like what will happen, what, what is likely to happen maybe to the snake population, so the snake population here, what's likely to happen to it if the toad population goes down? So the toad population goes down, that means that this is not there. What's gonna to happen to the snake population? Right, based on this diagram, will it increase, will it decrease, or decrease. probably no change? You know, here the snake has another source of food. If the toad population is not there, the snake is still getting food from the rabbits, still getting another food source of food. So it means that it's unlikely that the snake population is going to change. That's what we can say. It's, you know, it's unlikely that it's going to change. We're still getting food from the rabbits. Okay. Um, let's look at the uh, something like the, um, let's take the toad population. If you take the toad population here, and let's assume that we look at toad population, assume that the grasshopper population goes down. If the grasshopper population goes down, because the grasshopper has, is getting food only from Sorry, the toad is getting food only from the grasshopper right there. If there's no source of food here, then the toad population will go down. But it's not getting any other source of food. All right. So that's how you play around with this type of diagrams. You know, you just have to know 
which one is a primary consumer, secondary consumer, and so on. So let's go through that. So this is a producer, grass will be the producer, right? So producer here. Grasshopper is gonna be a primary consumer. Because that's the first level of consumption. It's feeding on the producer. Okay. Then the toad will be like a secondary consumer and so on. I keep going. And the snake would be like a tertiary consumer. If you follow this path here, it would be like um, a tertiary consumer. Okay, so it keeps going like that. Okay, all right. Then they can ask you what's an important member of the food chain, which is not shown on this uh, diagram. Then you know that the composer is an important member that is not shown on this diagram. Okay. So those are some of the ways that the questions could be asked. Okay. Any questions on these? Okay. So the food chain should be, and the food web should be fairly straightforward questions uh, when we get to them. Okay. Then you also had the food pyramid, the food pyramid. So the food pyramid looks like this, like a pyramid. Right. So it's a pyramid that shows the feeding relationship between organisms. Right. So the food pyramid shows the feeding relationship between organisms like we have here. Again, we have the primary. Um, the, let's begin with the producers. You have the producers always from the base. So you have the producers here. So these are the producers. They form the base. So we have grass as an example here. Right. Then we have the primary consumer here. Then you have the next level, secondary, and then tertiary. Right? As you go up, higher up, the number of organisms decrease. You know, that's why it's almost like a pyramid. You need more of those below to feed those above it. You know. So more grass to feed primary consumers, more primary consumers to feed secondary consumers, and so on. The organisms tend to become larger as you go higher up. So again, you can have the same questions, like how would a change in one population affect the other level and so on, just as we discussed. Very similar questions. Great. All right, so let's summarize with what I have here. It says, this interdependence of populations within a food chain helps to maintain the balance of plant and animal populations within the community. For example, when there are too many grasshoppers, there will be insufficient trees and shrubs for all of them to eat them, all of them to eat. Um, many grasshoppers will starve and die. Fewer grasshoppers means more time for the trees and shrubs to grow to maturity and multiply. Fewer grasshoppers also means less food is available for the toads to eat, and some toads will starve to death. When there are fewer toads, the grasshopper population will increase. All right, then the question I just asked is this what I have here. Predict the effect of low population of snakes in the pyramid above. And a question like, which category of consumer organisms is usually not shown in the food chain or food web or food pyramid, right? And we give the answers um, the decomposers, right? So that's a summary of all that I've just discussed. Okay. Then we have these feeding relationships that occur between um, organisms. Okay. We use the term symbiosis, symbiosis. All right. So symbiosis is the term used to describe the long term. So the long term relationship between two or more organisms. Long term relationship. 
symbiosis. And there are four types of symbiotic relationships or four types of relationship. The first one is parasitism. Then we have mutualism. We have saprophytism and then commensalism. So these are the four types of symbiosis, right? So what's parasitism? The words tell you what they mean. If you forget, you can look at the words. Paras, think of parasites. So parasitism. So, so under this type of relationship, one organism feeds on another and causes injury or harm to it. So the organism feeds and causes injury. Yeah. So any relationship where there's injury, one organism is feeding on the other one and it's causing damage. You have to think of a parasitic relationship occurring there, right? Example, if you have like bed bugs feeding on the blood of humans, right? They cause an injury to the human being. So that is a parasitic relationship. Think of tapeworm, like the worm in the intestines of humans. So the tapeworm feeds on, it sucks the blood from the intestines. So that will be an, and it causes damage to the intestine. So that will be an example of parasitic relationship, right? Or think of the malaria parasites, Plasmodium falciparum, right? It causes malaria in humans. It feeds on um, the red blood cells. So it's causing damage and causes damage. So that is a parasitic relationship. So when they give you a question, you have to look out for whether there's damage being caused by that organism as it feeds. Then you can say that you have a parasitic relationship, right? Parasite, parasitic relationship. Okay. Then the second one, which is mutualism, mutualism. So think of mutualistic associations, mutual, like beneficial to both. Something that's beneficial, mutual agreements. So this is a type of association in which both organisms. So here, both organisms benefit from the relationship, both. It's like you gain and I gain type of thing. You, know, you have a mutualistic association or mutualism. Now, example, the auspecker. The auspecker is a kind of bird, right? It lands on rhinos or zebras and it, 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 it ticks and other parasites that live on the skin, okay, live on their skin, right? The auspecker get food and the rhinos or the zebras are relieved of the pest. So both benefit from this relationship, right? So the auspecker is getting food, you know, by feeding the ticks on the zebra. And then the zebra is also being relieved of the damage caused by the, uh, of the, the, the pest or the ticks. So it's a beneficial relationship. One is getting food, the other one is being relieved of it. Okay. Another example, the crab, spider crab and algae. Spider crabs live in shallow areas of the ocean floor where they are easily preyed upon by other sea, creature, uh, sea creatures. The greenish brown algae lives on the back of the crabs. This makes them blend with the environment so that they become unnoticeable to predators. They both benefit because the algae gets a good place to live and then the crabs get camouflage. So you can see the beneficial relationship occurring there, both benefiting, right? And then another example, think of the bee and the flower. Bees fly from flower to flower gathering nectar, which they turn into their food. So while feeding on the nectar, the bees get some pollen on their hairy bodies. The pollen is transferred to the next flower when the, bees, the bee lands on it, leading to pollination. So in this mutualistic relationship, the bees get their food and the flowering plants get to reproduce, right? So the flower is benefiting from pollination by the bees. The bees are also getting nectar from it. So that's a mutualistic association. Right. So they give you examples like this if you were to tell the relationship, both benefits.
mutual. Then the other one is called commensalism, commensal. So commensalism. So in this relationship, one organism benefits. So one benefits, the other does not benefit or get injured. Okay, so here one benefit, there's no injury to the other one. There's no benefit to the other one, right? Only one is benefiting. Okay. So let's look at some examples of commensalism. Example would be if you take the shark, the shark and a remora fish. Right, a fish called Remora. Um, I, like if you watch the natural, natural, natural Geographic, sometimes you see some of these things, you know. The Remora fish feeds on crumbs that fall out of the mouth of the shark. The Remora fish benefits from feeding on the crumbs, but the shark does not benefit or lose anything, right? So as the shark is feeding, the food particles fall out of the mouth. And they are waste product for the shark. The shark doesn't need that. But the more I see those small, small fish they are swimming alongside a the shark. You know, they are feeding on the crumbs that fall out of the mouth. Okay. Those are like remora fish. They are benefiting from the leftovers, but the shark, you know, doesn't gain anything from or lose anything. Okay. They have the cattle and cattle egrets. The cattle and cattle egrets. You know, the cattle egrets are birds that live near cattle. Okay, so if you watch the TV, sometimes you see, as I said, the National Geographic, they show a lot of those things. You see the birds flying around the cattle. Okay. Uh, when the cattle graze, their movement stir up insects. The birds have their insects and the cattle are unaffected, right? So the cattle is feeding, they just, as they, their legs, you know, <laughs> the movement of their legs, um, the insect, they stir up the insects, so insects fly. And then the birds feed on the insects. You know, the cattle get nothing from it. Not gaining anything, no, it's not being harmed as well. So you have a commensalism, commensal relationship. Only one benefits. The other one is not injured or benefit. Okay. And then the fourth one is saprophytism, saprophyte, saprophytism or saprophytic relationship. Um, this relationship involves organism feeding on non-living. So the key word is the organism feeds on non-living things, non-living things, right? So the organisms are referred to as the saprophytes, okay? We call the organism saprophytes. Example with mold and bread. Think about mold and bread. Mold is a living organism, it's a fungus. Mold is a fungus that feeds on bread. So the bread is the non living thing. So the mold is a saprophyte. Okay, it feeds on non living um, thing. Okay. So these are the four types of feeding relationship that you should also be thinking about um, when you have a, a question. Okay. So parasitism, mutualism commensalism, and saprophytism. Okay. So let me pause for 30 seconds. Do you have any questions on this? Any questions? So far, so good. Okay. All right. So Let's look at another topic. Let's talk about mixtures. For this topic, you should know some examples of mixtures, right? And the other thing we'll talk about. So what's a mixture? So a mixture consists of two or more substances which have been combined such that each substance retains its own chemical identity, right? That is a combination of substances which are not chemically joined together. So the key word, they are not chemically joined. So mixtures are not chemical reactions. It's not, they still maintain their physical and, and chemical characteristics, right? 
they are not chemically combined. <coughs> so the key characteristics are, they have the same properties as their components, same properties as components. If I put sand in water, the sand maintains its properties, water maintains properties, there's no reaction, okay? There's no fixed proportion between the components. I can mix any amount of water with the sand. The components can be separated from the mixture. I can separate the two. I can separate the water from the sand by a, a certain process, right? So these are the properties of a mixture. Keyword, there's no chemical reaction combining the two, okay? Um, and examples of mixture, you have sugar and salt. If you mix them up, it's a mixture. Air is a mixture of gases made up of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and so on. A mixture of flour and sugar, salt and sand mixture, salt and water. These are all examples of mixtures. You can separate the components easily. And there's no chemical reactions between them. Uh, there are three types of mixtures, three types. One is a solution, we want to call it a solution. Two, we have suspensions. And three, we have what we call colloids. So we have solutions, suspensions, and colloids, all right? So let's look at what a solution is. A solution is a homogeneous is a homogeneous mixture of a solute in a solvent. So when I say homogeneous, homogeneous means that there's no bound a boundary that is visible in the entire solution. Homogeneous, no bound boundary is visible in the entire solution. So if I mix let's say um, sugar, I put sugar in water and mix them up. I cannot identify any boundary between the sugar and the water, right? It appears as if we have just one, uh, what we call one face, just one face, okay? So no boundary, that means one, you see only one face, okay? So homogeneous means no boundary is visible in the entire solution. The major component is called the solvent, and then the minor component is called the solute, right? So what we're saying is that solution is made up of what we call the solvent plus the solute. That's what makes up the solution. The major component is a solvent, and then the minor component is a solute. So the solute was being dissolved. Okay, and what does the dissolving is a solvent. Okay, so this the dissolved substance is known as a solute, and the substance that does the dissolving is known as a solvent. Okay. For example, in a salt solution, the water is a solvent, and then the salt is a solute. Right. Okay. So the components in the solute may not be separated from the solute by leaving it to stand or by filtration, right? So if I leave salt and water, uh, salt in water, it's not gonna separate, right? And then I cannot separate the two by using filtration. I can use filtration to separate the two, right? Because it's a homogeneous solution. And there are different degrees of saturation when you dissolve something. So let's talk about the degrees of saturation. A solution can be either saturated, unsaturated, or what we call super saturated. Unsaturated, saturated, and super saturated, all right? A solution that is unsaturated, this is what we mean by it. A solution is unsaturated if it can dissolve more solute at a given temperature, right? So let's take, 
room temperature and I have water. And I put, let's say, sugar in the water. Okay. At the beginning, let's say one spoon, right? And we're talking about room temperature. Let's say room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. If I add one spoon of sugar, it will dissolve at that temperature. Keep adding more. It will still be dissolving. All right, it's still going to dissolve. So at that point, we say that it is unsaturated because it keeps dissolving as much as it can at that temperature. All right, so it's unsaturated. Then, as I keep adding more, you can get a point where it's not going to dissolve anymore at that temperature, right? So at that point, I'm going to say that the solution is saturated, right? So we say that a saturated solution, um, we, we say that a solution is saturated if no more solutes. So we have no more solutes can be dissolved with temperature remaining constant. Right, so the temperature is the key. So at this temperature, it cannot dissolve anymore. Then I will say that the solution is saturated at that temperature. Okay. Now, but what if I increase the temperature? So let's say I, I begin, I warm this up, put on fire. So I'm increasing the temperature. So if I increase the temperature, I can add more sugar to this and it's still going to dissolve. I can put more sugar and it's still going to dissolve because I've increased the temperature, right? And it to keep increasing and increasing, keep adding more, keep adding more, it just keep dissolving. But it's going to get to a certain temperature at which it cannot dissolve again. At that point, we say that the solution is super saturated, super saturated, right? You cannot dissolve anymore, no matter what you do. So we say that a super saturated solution contains more solute than it will dissolve, right? Contains more solute than it would if the dissolved solute were in equilibrium with the undissolved solute, right? So it cannot dissolve any, anymore. So you're going to have the dissolved and undissolved in equilibrium. cannot dissolve more, super saturated. So those are the three levels of saturation. Three levels of saturation, saturated, unsaturated, super saturated. Okay. So remember temperature affects solubility, temperature. If you increase temperature, more will dissolve you know, until it gets to the point where it cannot dissolve again. So that is what a solution is all about. It's a homogeneous mixture. Okay. Then we have what we call the suspension. Suspension. So that's the second point. Point number two, suspension. So a suspension is a mixture of liquids with particles of a solid. So a mixture of a liquid with particles of a solid, which may not dissolve in the liquid. Okay. So the solid may be separated from a liquid by let, leaving it stand or by filtration, okay, so suspension. So let's say if I put sand in water, I have a suspension. I have the water, the sand. If I leave it, you see that it separates from it. So that's a suspension. It's not a solution. Okay. So liquid with particles of solid suspended in it. it doesn't dissolve. Then we have a colloid. Colloid. 
Now for colloid, know some examples of the colloid. Okay, they, they can ask examples of the colloid. Uh, so what is a colloid? Colloid are homogeneous also, right? So these are homogeneous. Non-crystalline substances consist of, consisting of large molecules or particles of one substance dispersed through a second substance, right? So it's homogeneous. You can have like there's no physical boundary. You don't see boundaries in the in the in the in the mixture. So homogeneous, non-crystalline. So not a crystal. Consists of large molecules or particles of one substance dispersed in it's dispersed through a second um, substance, right? Examples of colloids are gel, what we call salts, and emulsions. We'll talk about this shortly. Gel, salts, and emulsions, right? Um, the particles do not settle and cannot be separated out by ordinary filtration or centrifuging like those in suspension. So it's very important. You can't separate them by filtration or centrifugation or centrifuge like those in a suspension, right? So it's almost like in between, it's almost like in between um, the solution and the suspension. That's how the colloids look like in between. Okay. So what's an emulsion? The first type of colloid. So emulsion. This is a fine dispersion of minute droplets of one liquid in another, which is not soluble or miscible. Right, so fine minute droplets of one liquid in another. So you have one liquid dispersed in another. Okay, so like make up fine droplets, made into fine droplets in another. Okay, it's not soluble or miscible. Okay, so that is a colloid suspension is one liquid in another, right? It's like one liquid in another. Emotions may be temporary or permanent. Temporary or permanent. What do we mean by this? Temporary ones separate when left to stand for some time. Okay, permanent one will not separate, right? Um, so let's bring it down to everyday life. Example would be the, like oil and vinegar. When you mix oil with vinegar, you have a temporary uh, emotion. Okay, it's a temporary emotion because if you leave it, the oil will separate from the vinegar. Think of mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is egg yolk, egg yolk in oil. Right, that's a permanent type of emotion, right? So the egg yolk in oil, that is two, uh, two liquids, one dispersed in under, another, oil, vinegar, liquid, one dispersed in the other, you know, so that forms an emulsion, okay. emulsion. So know these examples. Okay. Then the other one is a soul. What is a soul? So the salt, these are colloids, or these are colloidal suspensions of small solid particles in a continuous liquid medium, right? So here talking about solid particles in a liquid medium. The first one, the emulsion is liquid in liquid, right? That's a station. Here, small solid particles in liquid medium. So uh, example, think of blood. Blood is an example of a soul. You have a liquid, you have solid particles in the blood. Okay. Or the solid particles in the blood, so you have soul. Pigmented ink and paints, right? The paint, you have liquid particle, you have liquid face with solid particles, Small, 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 small particles 
dispersed in it. So those are soils, so pigmented ink and paints. Examples of soil, right? So I said that if the dispersion medium is water, the colloid is referred to as hydrosol. So say hydrosol, it means that the dispersion liquid, the liquid part is water, hydro. Okay. Then if it is air, then it's called aerosol. So you have aerosol. Aerosol, that means that the dispersion medium is air, right? So have solid particles dispersed in air, they have an aerosol. Solid particles dispersed in water, hydrosol. Okay. And then the third one is the gel, what are gels? So gels are colloids in a more solid form than the salts. So they are colloids in a more solid form than salts. Okay. The dispersion, the, the dispersed phase has combined with the dispersion medium to produce a semi-solid material. Example would be like jelly, for example. Right. So anything that is jelly, like jelly-like, those are gels. Okay. It's a more solid form than the soil. So you should be able to identify this when you're given, uh, they ask which of the following is a colloid, which of the following is a suspension, which of the following is a mixture and so on. Okay. Okay. So, so try and know some examples. Okay. Great, so I believe this should be good for answering questions on mixtures, suspensions and colloids. All right. So let's bring our minds to a little bit of physics again, back to some physics topic. There's an interesting, simple apparatus called the electroscope, electroscope. Now the function of the electroscope is just to detect charges. That's all, that's all it does, to, to detect the presence of charges. So say an electroscope is used for detecting the presence of static electricity, right? It consists of two thin metal leaves. Example, uh, like gold leaves suspended from a metal hook. So this is what we're talking about here. This is how it looks like, like this. So this is like the gold leaves or the metal leaves is this here. That's a, the gold leaves can be here. Okay. This are this over here, the A. Then C, this is like a jar, just a regular jar. And then the B is a metal rod. That's the rod. Okay. So we say that gold leaves are suspended from a metal hook, or we can call it a hook, metal hook will be somewhere there. Or the hook. Okay. And then this is like a plate, metal plate. Okay, so it's a very simple apparatus. So how does this work? We said it's you to detect charges. So how does it work? This is what is gonna happen. Okay, so if a negatively charged body is brought near the terminal of the electroscope, it will cause electrons to be repelled into the metal leaves. A positively charged body attracts electrons out of the leaves. In either case, the leaves are now charged the same way as each other. 
so they repel each other. The amount they open up is proportional to the charge of the source, right? This is what we mean. Assuming that, let's say, I bring an object that is negatively charged over here, so negative charge, you know. Sometimes you can, if you comb your hair with a comb, you know, it, 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 the, the, the electrons separate, so the comb becomes charged, right? Like a negatively charged. You know, some material become positively charged, depend on what what it's made up of. Some become negatively charged. Okay. So we want to find the static electricity on it or charges on it. So let's say that I have a negative charge in my material, or if you rub it in your, in, your, in, in a on a cloth, something on a cloth, it becomes charged. When I bring it towards the plate, because it's negatively charged, it's gonna attract the positive charge from this rod to the plate. Opposite charges attract. So you're gonna have positive charges coming to the plate here. Opposite charge. And then what happens? It's gonna repel all the negative charges from the plate down to the end here, to the leaves here. So this negative charges go to the end. Okay, attracts positive and it repels all the opposite charges to the other side. Okay, so what's going to happen here? You have a negative charge on this plate here, negative charge on the other plates. Because they're the same charges, opposite, uh, same charges always repel, they move away. So the leaves will move apart from each other, all right? They move away from each other. And that will tell you that there's a charge on the material you're dealing with. Okay, it'll move away. Okay. So that's what it does you, to detect the presence of charges. Okay, let's try another one. Assuming this one is the object that I'm bringing is positively charged. If it's positively charged, so you have positive, what's gonna happen? It's gonna attract negative charges, opposite charge. So to the plate here, the, so it's gonna be negative charges will be attracted here. And it's gonna repel all the positive charges to the end. So the plates, the gold leaf will have negative charge at the end. Now they, they're gonna move away from each other because they're same charges, opposite, the same charges. So they're gonna repel each other. So they move away, they move apart, right? They move apart, okay. So once you see repulsion, that means that there's a charge on that particular um, object. Yeah. So that's how the electroscope works to detect the presence of charges. So they can ask you what happens if you bring maybe a positive charge, a positive charge object to this plate. What's going to happen? The gold leaves move apart, they move closer, they, they remain the same, or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Questions like that. All right, so that is a gold leaf, um, the electroscope, how it works. Okay. All right. So that should be fairly easy to uh, remember. Okay. All right, so with that, we'll go to another physics topic. Let's look at waves, very important. to know this too. So let's talk about waves. There are different types of waves. There's one called mechanical wave, and then we have electromagnetic waves, mechanical and electromagnetic waves. What's a mechanical wave? A mechanical wave requires a medium for its transmission. Whilst electromagnetic wave does not. So mechanical wave, you need a medium for its transmission. That means you need a material, some matter for it to travel. Whilst electromagnetic wave does not need a medium, right? Those, those are the two distinctions, okay? 
So mechanical wave means a medium wave. Medium needed. Okay. Electromagnetic wave. No medium. And on in, in a medium. Okay. Example. When you take sound waves, sound wave is an example of a mechanical wave, right? So sound needs a medium to travel. It, it can be water, it can be air, it can be solid material like wood, and so on. There should be a medium for it to travel in. So if I take out all the air from the room, I'll speak and you'll not hear me. You just see my lips moving and you'll not hear anything because there'll be no medium there. So sound cannot travel in vacuum. You need to have something there. But when you take light waves, light is an example of uh, um, electromagnetic wave. The light wave is an example of electromagnetic wave. So I don't need any medium. If I, you can still travel in, in vacuum. There's no air here light will still travel through the vacuum. Okay, so it's an electromagnetic wave. Okay, so know um, some of these examples. Sound wave mechanical, light wave is electromagnetic. Okay, know no, no that also. Okay. Um, there are a lot of electromagnetic waves. Like, you have all those X-rays, UV light, you know, microwave, they are all examples of electromagnetic waves. Okay. So think about X-ray, think about microwave, UV light. Radio waves, radio, you know, they are all electromagnetic waves. Radio can travel, wave can travel through vacuum. They are all examples. Okay. They can ask you some examples. Okay, all right. All right, so now let's look at some properties of the general properties of waves, general properties of waves. If you look at this diagram, okay, this is how the wave looks like. You know, if you plot a graph of um, time against the distance from the starting point, if something starts, a wave starts from, let's say, this point, and it's traveling in this direction, okay, I can draw a graph based on the its position from the starting point, you know, so time and distance, time and the distance. I can plot a graph like that. So if I plot a graph, starting point, we just go, it, you know, get something like this. You know. Think of the pendulum. If I have a pendulum, I can plot as it moves, I can plot its wave form. You know, starts from a starting point, then it goes back to its original position and then back and so on, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's how the wave travels, you know. So it gives this pattern that we have here, you know, what they call the sinusoidal wave, sinusoidal wave. Okay. So what are the properties of the wave. The first property is what we call the wavelength. You should be able to identify wavelength in diagrams. Sometimes they give you a diagram like this and you should identify the wavelengths. So what is a wavelength? This represents the length of one complete cycle. 
one complete cycle. The length from point A to E or C to G is one wave length. So let's come back here. So let's leave the starting point here. Starting point here. So the wave starts from point A, goes up, down, and back to this line. So this line here is like a reference line. The line is, this is a reference. We call it a reference line, right? That's like a starting um, point. So let me use a pendulum to illustrate that. So the pendulum is like this and it moves. So this is a starting point here, A. So let's say you swing it, you displace it up here, you displace it there. Okay. It's gonna swing to its original position and then move up to this direction and then backwards. So it goes from starting point, goes to the maximum, that's the maximum here, and then moves back to the original, that brings you here, moves in the opposite direction here, that is this here, and then back to the original. So that was back, opposite and back, right? To and flow. And then it starts all over again. Start starting position, maximum to original, opposite direction, and back to original. So swinging. That's like a sinusoidal curve. So the amplitude, sorry, the wavelength represents one complete cycle from here back and forth to back. I go back up, down and back. One complete cycle. Okay, so this is um, a wavelength from here, starting point goes up, down and back here. So the wavelength is this here, this is a wavelength from this point to that point, it's called a wavelength. That's a wavelength. Wavelength, okay. Point A to E. I can draw another wavelength. Another wavelength will be from, let's say C. If I start from C, down, up, and then back to original position. So this is another wavelength. So from C to G, I can call that a wavelength to this point here. That's also a wavelength. Okay, so I can identify so many wavelengths here. I can identify another wavelength. I'll show you another wavelength. We call this a peak here, this is called the crest, right? It's called the crest. And then the lowest point here, which is D, you call that the trough. It's called the trough. So the wave is made up of crest and troughs, crest and trough. So this is also a crest. That's a crest, okay? Crest and trough. I can, as I said, I can identify that wavelength. The distance, if I move from one trough, one crest down back to this crest, right? So the wavelength is gonna be this. This will be the wavelength. The distance between this crest to this crest, it's a complete cycle. That's also a wavelength. Wavelength. So I can see so many wavelengths here. If I added another, let's say trough here, if I go like this, and it's a trough here. So from trough to trough, that's also a wavelength. It's a complete cycle down from here, up, back to original, and then back to trough. That's also a complete cycle here, wavelength. That's a wavelength. Okay. So once you identify a complete cycle, then you can, the distance from the starting point to that point becomes your wavelength. So sometimes they draw diagrams and ask you to identify the wavelength and so on. All right.
So that's it. As I said, this represents the length of one complete cycle. Okay. Then amplitude. We have what we call amplitude. Amplitude. Amplitude is a maximum vertical displacement from the resting position, right? The reference point is also known as a resting position. Resting position, that's a reference point. The line here, the resting point. So the amplitude is the maximum vertical displacement. So let's come here. If you take from here to that point like this, this is amplitude. That's an amplitude. All right, from this point, maximum displacement down, this point to that point here, this is also an amplitude. That's an amplitude. Okay, there's an amplitude here from there to that point. Amplitude. So it's a maximum displacement from the original, from the reference point. Okay, amplitude, amplitude. Okay. So you have OB, uh, y, y to D, where's Y? Uh, y to D. Let me get rid of this here. Okay, so let's say that the O somewhere here, let's, it's, not, it's not part of the diagram, but let's say this is O, the OB, will be the ampl amplitude here, y to d. So d, if I put y here, then it's this point you're talking about. Those are the amplitudes. So the size of the amplitude is related to loudness or the intensity of sound, right? So when it comes to the ear, in, in terms of sound, uh, there's a question, that relates amplitude to sound. So remember that the amplitude represents loudness, how loud a sound is. That is the, that um, relates to amplitude. So the sound is very loud. You have a loud, you have a, a, a large amplitude, right? Maximum displacement from the starting point, okay? Loud. If sound is low, the amplitude will be small. You know, so amplitude is related to loudness of sound, loudness. So that's why I put it in bold italics. Loudness of sound. There's a question that comes up like that. Okay. Then we also have what we call frequency. Frequency is the number of cycles per second. The number of cycles per second. And frequency is related to the pitch of sound, the pitch, whether it's low pitch or high pitch, right? Some people can sing the very high pitch sound. They can even break glass of, you know, so high pitch, high frequency, low pitch, low frequency. So that's how you can remember that. So frequency, as I said, if you take one second, so is this your wave? And let's say this is one second. Put one second here. Now a wave, let's say I have a wave that goes like this, two, three, four, and then, right. So the number of cycles I have, there's one cycle, one, two, and I have about three cycles, right? In one second. Let's create another one. I'll use a different color, red. If I have this, within the same minute, so within the same second, I have more cycles. The red one has more cycles per second. So the red one will have a higher frequency than the black one. Okay, we have more cycles in one second than the other one. Okay, so I can even draw more. One second, maybe that goes. <laughs> so this will be high frequency. You have more cycles within the same one second, you know. So that's why I say the number of cycles per second is a frequency, right? 
and frequency determines the pitch of the sound. So this high frequency, like, that means the pitch is very high. Low frequency, low pitch. Okay, so that's how you to relate frequency to sound, the sound that we hear. Okay, and so, so let's summarize that here and say that large, or let's say loud, loud let's say loud sound. Loud sound. So that will mean that we have large amplitude. So that's one. Two, low sound. That means small amplitude. Then when you come to frequency, low frequency, that means we have low pitch. It is high frequency, then we have a high, a high pitch sound. So that's how they are related. Okay. All right, so I put down some questions over here um, for us to identify some parts of a given wave. Okay, okay so help me identify some part of this given wave. Okay. So what will be the wavelength of the wave in the diagram above? Okay, the wavelength of the wave in the diagram above is given by which by a, a letter. Which letter is that? Anybody wants to try? Is it A? Yes, A is a wavelength because this is a complete trough, uh, this crest to crest. So it's a complete cycle, right? Trough. So that's A, that's correct. Okay. Then the amplitude of the wave in the diagram above. Amplitude. Yeah. Somebody else should try. Would it be um, e? Um, the amplitude. Amplitude is the vertical. Yeah, amplitude is a vertical displacement from the reference points. Take a second guess, D. <laughs> D. Yeah, D is correct. So it's D, because that is that, that's the reference point. Remember the line is the reference point, and the vertical displacement is down. So that is that is amplitude. Okay. And then radio waves are what type of waves? Electromagnetic or mechanical? Radio waves. Electromagnetic. Yes, electromagnetic wave, electro. All right, good. All right, so when you're studying, please try and remember the parts of the wave, right? Should we identify them? Good. All right, so I believe so far so good. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, today we're gonna have a lot of time to answer questions in front of the book, so. I'm trying to finish everything today, at least. All right, good. So um, I think we talked about enzymes already and catalysts. We did that some time ago. 
Um, but somebody asked a, a good question today, so it looks like it's also here. Uh, so, so just a quick reminder. So, so enzymes and catalysts. Catalysts represent any substance that can speed up the rate of chemical reaction. They do not take part in the reaction. Hence, they remain on change at the end of the reaction. Uh, for example, enzymes are proteins that speed up the rate of chemical reactions in living organisms. Enzymes act on specific substances. They act well within certain optimal temperature and pH ranges. Right? So the question that she asked, we, we look at the temperature, um, they get a temperature of 25. So the enzyme that you, you pick should be the one that acts around the 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, they are denatured or destroyed when the temperature and pH are too high or too low. So there's, they always act with a, a narrow range of temperature and pH. Okay. All right. So that is what we did some time ago. Just a quick summary of that again. All right, good. Uh, we want to look at another topic known as the gas laws. So the gas laws, I want you also to know this inside out, the various gas laws, okay? So this table summarizes what the gas laws are, you know, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about it now. So the, yeah, three, um, let's talk, the, let's say three main laws that govern gases. And then the other ones are like derivatives of those three laws, right? So let's begin, begin with the basic, the three basic laws that govern gases. So one, I'll talk about Boyle's law. Boyle. Okay. So Boyle's law. So this law states that at a constant temperature, So take note of this constant temperature. I'm going to underline that it's very important. At the constant temperature, it says that the volume of a gas varies inversely. I'm going to align that inverse variation. So it varies inversely as the um, as the pressure, right? So the inverse variation is very important here. So at a constant temperature, the volume of a gas varies inversely as the pressure. Okay, what does this mean in simple terms? It means that as you increase the pressure, the volume of the gas decreases and vice versa, right? So increase pressure, uh, this increase pressure. So let's say pressure up, let me make arrow simple. Pressure up, it means the volume will go down, okay? If pressure goes down and the volume goes up, that's that's a relation inverse, inverse relationship. Okay, so think of the graph. So the graph is like we're going to look like this, something like if you have pressure and volume, one goes up, that one comes down, like that type of relationship, like a negative slope. One up, that one goes down. So, so think about. Let's say have the plunger and piston, or let's say the tie, the pump, bicycle pump. If this is your initial volume, and then let's say pressure here, okay, what's going to happen if I increase the pressure? So increase the pressure, pressure up here. Then the volume, look at the volume, it goes down. The volume becomes smaller, volume goes down. 
Okay. Increase pressure, volume goes down. And if I release the pressure, and the volume will increase. So, so that's the relationship. Now, questions on this come in so many different forms, so many different forms, scenarios, all right? So I'll give you one scenario in the living, in the, in the human being or living organism. Think about our um, taking in air, breathing, right? If you're taking, your, there's inspiration for us to take in air into the lungs, what happens? So inspiration, let's see what happens here. So for me to take in air, that my thoracic, the volume in my thoracic cavity will have to increase. Right, so that the pressure inside will go down. Because that's the inverse relationship. So what happens is what your rib cage, they, 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 it moves up, right? It moves up. What happens to the diaphragm? The diaphragm flattens. So the volume here is up. The volume goes up. If the volume goes up, what happens to pressure? The pressure will be down within the thoracic cavity, right? So now the pressure outside is higher. You have high pressure, atmospheric pressure. Now it's high. All right, it's, it's higher than the thoracic. So what happened? The air will rush in. And that's what happens during inspiration. Okay, because the pressure inside is low and always um, gas will move from high pressure to low pressure. Okay. Now, what about expiration? If you have to breathe out. If I have to breathe out, so we're gonna have the opposite occurring, expiration. So now the volume in the thoracic cavity will have to go down, right? So the diaphragm becomes like dome shaped. It contrasts from the dome shape. And what happens? The, now the volume, the thoracic volume has now decreased. Once the, thoracic, the volume of the thoracic, uh, the, the thoracic volume has decreased, it means the pressure inside here will increase. Pressure goes up. The pressure in thoracic cavity is up. So now the pressure inside is higher than the atmospheric pressure. High pressure inside, the atmospheric pressure is so low atmospheric pressure now. It's lower. So now the gas carbon dioxide comes out. You release your CO2. Okay, here you're taking your oxygen. That's what happens. It is all related to Boyle's law. Boyle's law relationship. Okay, that's what is occurring here. Okay, so know this scenario very well to answer questions on Boyle's law. Okay. Um, yeah, sometimes they give you some experiments where they also test you on them. We'll definitely see some examples once I finish the brief lecture. Okay. So that's Bohr's law. Okay. So mathematically, this is how we summarize the Bohr's law. So let's go to the table. So mathematically, If you multiply the pressure by the volume, it gives you a constant. Pressure times volume is equal to a constant. That is what the Boyle's law says. Okay, because the pressure is up, the volume has to go down to maintain the constant, right? So 
if I know initial volume, initial pressure, P1, V1, it should be the same as final pressure, P2, V2. It's, they should get a constant value. So this is a mathematical representation. Initial times pressure times final volume should go to initial final volume times the final pressure because they're constant. So that's the summary I have in the table right here. Um, what happened here? Yeah. I think I deleted what I was doing here. Give me a second. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> this is a summary as, as I just discussed. You know, the formula for Bohr's law, you know, and then the description is here, all right? At the constant T, as pressure increases, the volume decreases and so on, okay? Then the second one is known as Charles' law, Charles. So Charles' law. So Charles law does says that at a constant pressure, this is the pressure is constant. So at a constant pressure, okay, it says that the volume of a gas varies this time the word is varies directly directly as the temperature okay so here we have what we call the direct variation okay, so the pressure is constant constant pressure and then direct variation, okay. What do you mean by direct variation? It means that the increase is in the same direction or the decrease is in the same direction. In other words, if you increase the temperature, temperature up, the volume would increase. Temperature down, volume down. That is Charles' law, okay, Charles' law. In other words, it's like they change the same direction by like going like that. Same direction of change. Okay. Mathematically, this is the formula. Okay. In other words, the ratio of initial volume to initial time, sorry, initial temperature 
should be equal to final volume over the final temperature, T2. So V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, okay? That's how they are related, okay? Charles law. So one way you can remember Charles law, example, think of the balloon, right? The balloon, as I increase the temperature, what's gonna happen? The, the, the balloon is gonna increase in size. The volume will increase and increase and increase as I increase temperature. That's it's gonna increase with increase in temperature. So this is an example of Charles law occurring. Constant pressure, if you don't change the pressure. Then the third law is the Gay-Lussac's law. So this is one, two, three, Gay-Lussac's law. So under Gay-Lussac's law, that one says at a constant volume, so the volume that is constant, Okay. If you keep the volume constant, now you can realize that as you increase the temperature, the pressure will go down. So as pressure increases, temperature increases. That's Gay-Lussac's law. So let's put that one down. Gay-Lussac. So that one says that at a constant volume, the pressure of a gas varies, again, this is directly, directly, as the temperature okay in other words if you increase the temperature pressure increases if you decrease temperature pressure goes down same level, uh, direction of change right so just like again same direction of change one goes up, the other one goes up. If you think of the graph, like a positive slope type of thing. Okay. So the relationship between this mathematically, then you have a like, similar to the volume and temperature. So P1, T1 is the same as V at P2, T2. direct variation. The ratio is constant, or the two is constant. Okay. So what is an example of this? Example would be, think about boiling water. If you put water on fire, and it, you've covered, so this water, and you have fire, you've covered it. If you've covered it, you have air, air here. So as the temperature increases, what happens? Now you're gonna have the lead being pushed up, right? The pressure in here increases as you increase the temperature. No. So the lead, we see it being pushed up as you boil the water. You got the, vol the pressure is increasing. You've maintained the volume, this constant volume here. The gas here is constant. So that is as an example of Gay-Lussac's law. All right, so those are the three main gas laws. If you can remember, it's gonna help you in answering questions. So when you come to the table, that is a summary right there.
Now, from all these three laws, we have the other laws called the combined law. If you know the, the first three laws, that's good. And then this one, you can work out. So the combined law is a combination of all the three um, laws here. Okay, so you see the PV is this, that's PV, and then in the inverse relationship between the two. So it means the multiplication of the two, pressure and volume, it's a constant. And then if you look at the temperature, temperature, the direct variation. So P over T, that's a P over T, V over T, because it's a direct variation. And so it's all these three laws combined gives you what you have here. P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2, you know. So depending on what you know, you can find any missing part of the equation. Right? But the important thing is to remember the first three and scenarios to use for this test. Okay. They have something called the ideal gas law. Okay, ideal gas law. Um, it's difficult to find ideal gases. In, <laughs> but this is the formula for ideal, what we call ideal gas. No. Um, PV is called NRT, but don't worry yourself too much with this for this test, not too much needed. Important is the first three and the scenarios. Okay. okay. All right. So this should be enough for the gases. Any questions on the gas laws? Okay. All right. So we're getting slowly to the end of the important topics. All right. All right. So another important topic that's radio radioactivity and half life. Radioactivity and half life. So let's look at that. Uh, I believe that will be the last one I want to talk about, and then we can answer questions. So radioactivity and half life. Another very important one. So what is radioactivity? Radioactivity is a random process that happens naturally as the isotopes in particular elements decay, right? Remember isotopes. Isotopes are at, uh, atoms with the same atomic numbers, but different masses. We saw some of them um, during the beginning of the lectures, right? Like if I take carbon 12, atomic number of six, and the mass is 12. There's an isotope of this, which is carbon 14, right? Same atomic numbers, but the mass numbers are different. In other words, they differ in the number of neutrons, right? As we've already seen in the first lesson. Okay. So these are isotopes of each other. Okay. So when isotopes decay, right? Decay means to break down. So when we talk about decay here, we're talking about the isotopes breaking down or disintegrating, disintegrates. Or breaks down. Okay, so I'm going to use the word decay, you know, as we go on. So I said, radioactivity occurs when an isotope decays, all right, naturally in a natural environment. All right, the isotopes continue to break down over time. The length of time that is taken for half of the nuclei in an element to decay is called its half-life. Very important keyword, half-life. Okay, so half-life is the time taken for half of the substance to decay or to break down, you know, half-life. So sometimes you see in your chemistry class, the right T half like that, that's a half-life or the half-life, okay, T half. So let me explain this a little bit more to you.
I'm going to make up an example here. Okay. So let's say that I have a substance which is about 100 grams of a substance. Okay. And I tell you that this substance has a half life of maybe four days, has half life of four days. Now see what I'm gonna do. You can use this approach to answer questions. Yes, mathematical arithmetic approach. It means that first four days or every four days, half of this will be left. So four days, half of this will be left. So I have 50 grams left after four days because the half life is four days. So half a substance will be left. Another four days, half of this will be left. So I will left with 25 grams. Another four days, half of that will be left. So I have 12.5 and so on. Because the half life is four days. So every four days, half of the substance will be left, half will be left. Okay. So you can use this arithmetic approach to answer questions. Okay. So they could give you a question where you have the mass given, then they tell the half life, then they, they can ask you, how many of the substance will be left maybe after eight days? For, so for example, for this one, I can ask you uh, how much of the substance will be left after maybe 12 days? If I 12 days, how much of, of the substance will be left if I start 100 grams? So you're gonna use this, you know, the half-life. So break it down every four days, four days, four days. So it means that after 12 days, you'll be left with 2.5 grams. Or the substance. And just using this simple approach. Okay. Sometimes they will tell you how much of the substance is left after a certain number of days. Then they'll ask you to find the um, half life. Okay, that's the other way the question could be asked find the half life. So same thing, so let's just say 100 grams. Then they tell you that maybe after eight days, you have 2.5. So eight days later, you have maybe 25 grams left. Find the half-life or what is the half-life? You, you, can, you can use the same approach. So what you're gonna do, draw the diagram that I just did, like the tree diagram that I just drew and then use it. So if you start with 100 grams, that means that first half life, 50 will be left. Another half life, half of this will be left, 25. So we start with 100 grams, you have 25 grams. All right, now they told you that it eight days to reach 25. So it means from here all the way there, eight days. How many half lives we have here? We have two. First half life here, and then second half life here. So it means that I have to split this eight into two parts. So it means that this is going four days here, and then this will be four days to get to the eight. So the half life of this is going to be four days. That will be the half life. You can use this approach to answer any question given to you on this half-life. Yeah. Now, if you're doing um, 
chemistry proper, there is a formula, that log formula that can also be used, all right? But you don't need to go into that for this test. It will give the same answer if you use a log approach. You can just draw simple arithmetic like this. Okay. Any questions on half-life? Half-life. So that's one way you can have a question on radioactivity, calculating the half-lives. All right, so what are the types of radioactivity that we know of? Know some of the radioactivity, the process. The radioactive substance or isotope, they give off particles. They give off particles. Um, those particles are what we call the radioactive emissions, right? The types are, we have what called alpha decay. One of them is called the alpha decay, alpha. And this high alpha decay, that's what it looks like. It's with alpha and a four is a mass and two is it like the, it's atomic number, right? So we see alpha four, four, then you are talking about redu um, alpha decay. If you look at this, this is like a helium, it's a helium atom of four and two. Helium atomic mass of two and a mass of four. Okay. So it's a alpha decay, it's a helium atom that's given off, right? So this is like a general expression to represent what's happening, right? So sometimes they can give you something like, uh, I'm gonna make up something. No, it's not an actual radioactive substance. So let's say I have X and this is 50 here. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me make this like 50. And let me make this like, um, let's say I put 10 here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this gives off an radioactive element to become it gives you like alpha particle, right? So they can write either helium or the alpha particle, then they put four and two here. And this can be missing. We're trying to find the numbers here for the Y, element Y. It's pretty much straightforward to do this. Always make sure that some of the atoms and the numbers on the, um, the masses add up, right? Left and right should balance. The, atomic numbers should also match. The left and right should be the same, right? In other words, this 50 should be equal to the box plus four, right? To get what is the, the, the mass here. In other words, this should be what 40. So Y has to be 46 here. And the same for the atomic numbers, the atomic numbers, the, you have 10 on the left side, which will be equal to what is missing plus this two. They should also match. So it means that this has to be eight. So this has to be eight here. Okay. So this will be the element that you're looking for. Right. So you have questions similar to like this. Make sure the masses add up. Left and right should balance. Left and right should balance like this the sum of those numbers. Okay. So that's one way. Okay, you have a question. Okay. When you say beta decay, beta decay, this is what we mean. It's like it's like losing an electron. So this is a beta particle. Okay, so this alpha particle. is a beta particle or beta decay. Okay, they are the same thing, decay or particle. So, and this is, there's no mass on this, but it has a charge of negative one, right? So it's like an electron. So that's a beta decay. Yeah, you can have the same question like I discussed here. Yeah. They have a 
positron em em emission. Positron is a as a positive atomic number, zero mass. Okay. Very similar. Okay, positron. You can have electron capture like X-ray. Yeah. You can have gamma. Gamma emission. Gamma has no charge. No zero charge, zero mass. That's a gamma emission. Okay. So very similar. You know. So three main ones, if you're alpha particle or alpha decay, beta decay, um, and gamma, those are common, common ones, okay, the, the particles. Okay. Then there are two main types of nuclear reactions, two main types of nuclear reactions, nuclear reactions. One of them is called fission, spontaneous fission. And then the other one is called fusion, nuclear fusion. So you have nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Okay. Now for nuclear fission, fission means splitting. So split, splitting of the radioactive substance. So let's say I have A, then breaking down into B, C, you know, and then the radioactive particle. So like this one is given off neutrons. Neutrons, that's the N, zero and one here, that's neutron. So let's say give some, some neutrons. Then you have splitting, that's nuclear fission. Now nuclear fusion, fusion means joining. The join, joining of the nuclei, the nucleus join to form like a bigger one. So let's say I have A plus B giving me like C. Then I have nuclear fusion, right? So you should identify this when they give you. So like for this one, if they give you, they'll give you like the elements, you see the elements. And then if they are joining, you can say that you can say it's fusion. If they are splitting up, then you think of, um, what do you call it? The nuclear um, fission. And this generates a lot of energy, just a lot of energy. So like the, the atomic bomb, atomic bomb, for example, was nuclear fission, you know, very powerful. It, it caused a lot of damage. And this is what you, they are used to produce electricity and so on. In nu nuclear reactors, they use nuclear fission mostly to generate a lot of energy, you know, for electricity and so on. You know, but some people also use it for red bathrooms. So this should be enough to um, for nuclear. I want to call it the reactivity. Um, I have a summary of the properties here. The properties. Okay. So the properties, if we take the alpha particles, just a paper can stop the particles right, from, from um, moving out. Now, beta particles, they, are, they, they can pass through paper, paper, but they'll be stopped by thin metal sheets. Gamma particles and X-rays, they can pass through all metal sheets and then they can be stopped by lead. So lead, thick lead or steel plates can stop X-ray and gamma rays. Right? So they're very powerful um, 
particles. They can cause a lot, a lot of damage. The neutrons, neutron, uh, the neutron rays, they can pass through paper, metal sheet, thick legs. They can only be stopped by concrete or water. You know, they can stop the neutron particles. Okay. So those are some of the properties, how intensive they are. Okay. And then examples of radioactive decay, all that I discussed, these are real life examples. You know, real life examples. So we have uranium, uranium atomic number of two, uh, 92, the mass of 238, 92 and 238. If it releases the alpha particle, which is a helium like this, it forms a new substantatorium. Okay. So if you look at this, the, the numbers match, right? The atomic masses on the left side match the right side. Atomic numbers, if you add them up, left and right, you should match and so on. These are real examples. Okay. Then beta particle or beta decay, these are examples of them. Examples. Okay. Positron, electron. You know, electron capture means that it, it captures an electron. It's an electron, this one is like electron captures and to form this. Okay. Spontaneous fission, this is splitting to give you this, this and that. It gives of the neutron particle. Okay. Yeah. All right, so these are some examples. Okay. And then we just discussed the half-life. Okay. So I believe this should be enough for playing around with questions on radioactivity. Does anybody have any questions on this radioactivity? And I'll touch on this last topic. Okay. Um, I believe you have questions you can ask me during the discussion session. All right. So the last part is to look at light and the properties of light, light and its properties. Okay. Now, the first property of light, remember we said light is an example of, um, of electromagnetic wave, right? So properties of light. The first property is the fact that light can be reflected. So we'll talk about reflection of light. Reflection of light, okay. So light can be reflected on the surface of a mirror, right? So think about this, a mirror here, that's a mirror. Now the, we call this the light ray. If I have the light here, shine the light, in from this angle. This ray from the light to the mirror is known as the incident ray. And then the ray is reflected in the opposite direction by, uh, in the opposite direction, represented by this ray here called the reflected ray. So it is a reflected ray, right? So reflection is a change in the direction of light as it's hits a reflective surface or like a, it hits a mirror. The path changes, it's going this way and then the path goes back in the opposite direction. Okay. If I draw a line perpendicular to the surface of the mirror, we call this line here the normal. So this is a normal line. Normal line is perpendicular to the surface. So anytime I draw a line perpendicular to any surface, it's called a normal line. Because it's 90 degrees, okay, normal. And that's this normal line here. Now the angle between the normal line and the incident ray, this angle I is known as the angle of incidence. And then the angle between the normal and the reflected ray is called the angle of reflection, angle of reflection, okay? So remember that the I is always equal to the R, the same angles. 
Okay, so sometimes they can give you a question where this is a, they draw something angle, this is a mirror, this strikes that, and then normal. And let's say this is 30 degrees. And they ask you, what is this? R. Then you know it's 30. Okay. So I is equal to R. Very important to remember. Angle of reflection is equal to angle of, refraction, uh, of um, reflection. Angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Okay, that is the point to remember here. Okay, so that's reflection of light. Then light can also be diffracted. So you have diffraction of light, diffraction. Okay, so diffraction, this is defined as the bending of light waves around obstacles in its path. Around obstacles in its path. Example, when a light wave passes through a barrier with a small opening, it acts as a small point source from where light emerges and spreads in all direction, right? So before I explain this, I want you to think about like the microscope. If this is the slide and I have a, let's say bacteria, small bacteria here, and then you shine the light for the micro light shines here. The light can go through the bacteria, right? Because it's solid. But what happens is that the light, we say that light travels in a straight line, but then it can bend a little bit. The light can bend a little bit around the bacteria. So that slight bending of the light is what we call diffraction of light, right? The bending of the light around small objects. Okay. So if you look at a microscope, the bacteria will appear like dark, dark, dark spots. Dark spots on a slide with a halo of light around it. Because the light graces the edge of the bacteria. You know, so they appear like dark, dark spots. So the bending of light around small objects is what we call diffraction, diffraction of the light, okay, right? So the same thing applies if the light here yeah, holes, for this, as the example given here, it yeah, holes. When the light rays hit the hole here, there's a little bending around the hole here, you know, so it comes out, <coughs> that's why it comes out like, you know, it does something like this, the waves, they express out like that. That's why you have these waves. Yeah. So the bending around a small, like that tiny hole, is known as diffraction, okay? Then we can also have what we call refraction, refraction of light. So this is refraction, all right? So refraction of light is a bending of light as it passes from one medium to another of different densities, okay? So the refraction is what makes objects appear closer to the surface. If you have an object in water, it appears as if it's close to the surface. It's all because of refraction due to bending of light. So if you look at this one, let's say the fish is at the bottom of the water here or the pond here. Now the light rays, this is the light ray, the blue is the light ray, right? So instead of going, the light ray going all the way straight like that, it doesn't go straight. It ends up bending to give this red light and the red ray, you know? So now if you trace backwards, it appears as if the object is coming from here where the fish is back like that. You know? Apparent change in there, in depth. So it, it appears closer to the surface than it is, you know. So that is called refraction, okay. So another example, let's say you can draw it this way. I'm gonna draw, let me see if I have the diagram here. Okay, uh, I have to draw the diagram. All right, so let's say that I have a glass 
so in the lab we have like a glass prism or glass block. Okay. So this air around it. So I have air here, air out. Okay. So if I shine light on the surface like this, so I have the light here. This will be called the incident ray. So this is called the incident ray here. Incident ray. Okay. So when the light travels, the air is less dense than, than water, right? So what happens is that the ray travels faster in the air. It's less dense. So it travels faster in the light travels faster in the air. Okay. So now it's moving to a dense, high density here, which is a glass block, high density. Okay. So when it's traveling to this, it's going to slow down, slowing down in the block. That means that it's going to move closer to the normal. Okay, I'm gonna draw a normal here. So the normal line to the surface, let's draw a normal to the surface, this surface here like that, as a normal. A line perpendicular to the surface. So if I draw a normal on this boundary, instead of this going all the way straight like that, it doesn't go straight in, but it bends towards the, line is going to bend towards the normal line so you're going to travel bend like that this bending means that it's slowing down it travels slower in the glass block right this is what we call this ray here it's called the refracted ray refracted ray that's a refracted ray okay now, from the glass block, if we move it, it moves out. I'm drawing, I'll draw a normal normal here at the other boundary. If I draw a normal at the other boundary, now this ray is going to, light ray is going to emerge out of the glass block into the air. So it's going to travel faster. Again, it's coming out, so it travels faster. Traveling faster means the ray moves away from the normal when it moves it's fast. So now it's going to, instead of going straight like this, it's going to move faster, so it moves away from the normal. You know, so you have a diagram that looks like this. Okay. So the angle here is not the angle of incident I here. Now the angle in here is known as the angle of refraction. So this here is called the angle of refraction. Of refraction. And this one is angle of incidence. incidents okay so angle of fraction angle of incidence okay. and then when you come here think about these are like two parallel lines and this are, the normals are like two parallel lines so it means that the angle here is the same as the angle here it's going to be the same thing here again this will be r but it's like a two parallel lines and it's like a transversal okay so if it's coming out, it means the angle here will be similar to the angle there, I, very similar to that. If you think of power lines. Okay. So there's something called uh, refractive index. Every substance has its own refractive index. Refractive index. Okay. And the refractive index is defined as the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction. If you take the ratio, it gives you, it's constant for every material, right? So water has its own refractive index, glass has its own refractive index. That means ability to bend um, light. You know? And this is known as what we call Snelling's law. 
Snelling's law. So when they ask you which instrument do you need to find a Snelling's law, then they gave you ruler, protractor, micrometer, and something else, you should be able to determine what the answer is. Okay. So here you are measuring angles. Because you measure angles, you need a protractor to measure angles. Okay. So Snelling's law, the ratio of the angles, sign of the angle of incidence to the angle of refraction. Okay. So that is Snelling's law as related to the fraction of light. Okay. The bending of light as it passes from one medium to another. When the medium is dense, it travels slower in it. If it's less dense, it travels faster in that medium and so on. Traveling fast means that it moves away from the normal. If it comes, if it bends close to normal, it means that it's traveling slower in that object and so on. Okay. So I have a summary in a summary here. I so said light travels faster than air, slow in water, and slower still in glass. The slower light is the slower light is in the medium, the more it refracts or bends in it. Right? More bending. The measure of how much light refracts in a medium is called its index of refraction, refractive index. So these are some examples of refractive index. Air is 1.0.0.000293, so around one right, for, for air. And then water is 1.33 and so on. Glass 1.4, diamond 2.4, okay, refractive index. So the amount of light I can bend, the degree. And then the last property is known as dispersion of light, dispersion. So for dispersion of light, it means splitting of light into its component colors. Splitting light into its component colors. That's what we call dispersion, right? So remember, I have white light splitting of. Let me do, qualify this a little bit. Split of white light. The key is white light. Okay. So if I have what we call the glass prism, this the glass prism in the lab, and then shine white light like sunlight through it, it's going to split up into the rainbow colors. Right, so that separation into the component colors is what we call um, dispersion of light. Okay, so remember the rainbow colors, Roy, G, Vive, demonic to remember. So it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, Roy, G, Vive. So that is, what you should know for the properties of light, reflection, refraction, diffraction, and dispersion, right? Properties of light. Okay. So any questions, I believe that is the end for the lesson for today, for the science. Okay. All right, any questions before we, we discuss some Things in the book. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's go to the book and see how we can apply this to questions, and then we'll take a little break after this. Okay, so let's look at page 219, page 
Now let's start with 218 first, right? Page 218, and then we'll come to 219. Number one, an organism with chloroplasts in its cells is probably A, heterotroph, B, autotroph, C, herbivore, and then D, primary consumer. He has chloroplast. What is the number? Number one. Is B. Yeah, it's an autotroph. It's like, it has chloroplast, so that means that it's an agosphot photosynthesis. So it's autotroph, correct. Okay, let's look at number two. We didn't mention it, but Let's just talk about that. What property of water allows someone to fill a glass slightly above the rim without the water flowing over it? A, specific gravity. B, capillarity. C, opacity. And then D, surface tension. D. Yeah, it's known as surface tension. Okay. Surface tension is the ability of a substance to act like an elastic you know, membrane. So like surface tension, tension is at the surface between the water and the air. Okay, page 219, number seven. As light passes obliquely from air to water, it is bent. This bending is called A, diffraction, B, reflection, C, refraction, and D, dispersion. C. C, refraction, correct. So next time it could be any of the other ones. So we are studying, that's why it's good to study all, just in case you have this question. Page 220, 220. Number 15 says, which group of organisms helps prevent the accumulation of organic waste in nature? A, rabbits, B, mosses, C, bacteria, D, ferns. C, bacteria. Yeah, bacteria. So here we're talking about the composers, right, the, the composer. So that's a bacteria, as an example. Number 16, as the eardrum is made to vibrate more rapidly, the sound is perceived as, so you talk about rapid vibration, sound is perceived as A, louder in intensity, B, softer in intensity, C, higher in pitch, D, lower in pitch. C, higher in pitch. Yeah, higher in pitch. So rapid vibration means that the frequency is high, right? High frequency. I remember I said high frequency, high pitch sound. You know, high frequency, high pitch. So rapid vibration, high frequency. Let's see, uh, page 226, page 226. Number 48, number 48. Which of the following organisms has a nutritive process most similar to that of animals? A, seaweed, B, oak tree, C, grass, and then D, bread mold. D. 
D, yeah, bread mold. Bread mold. So it's similar to, so they release and digest and absorb. Okay. All right, 49. The solubility of a solid in a liquid generally increases with A, increase in temperature, B, an increase in pressure, C, a decrease in temperature, and then D, a decrease in pressure. Solubility. A. A, correct. An increase in temperature, as we said, increase in temperature, solubility increases. Okay, All right, good. Uh, page 227. 227. Look at number 52. It says, in humans, if the diaphragm is pushed upward, there is a decrease in chest volume. This decrease is followed by A, an increase in pressure in the chest cavity and inhalation. B, an increase in pressure in the chest cavity and exhalation. C, a decrease in pressure in the chest cavity and inhalation. And D, a decrease in the pressure in the chest cavity and exhalation. B. You said B. Yes. So let's see. So the diaphragm is pushed up. When the diaphragm is pushed up, it means that the volume in, of the thoracic cavity has decreased. So the volume goes down, the pressure inside the thoracic cavity has increased. So that means that the air will have to push out, right? So decreased volume means increased pressure. Increased pressure means you're going to push air out. So that's exhalation. So your B is correct. It's correct. So whose law is that? Wh which law is that is being applied here? Is it Boyle? Yeah, that's Boyle's law. Boyle's law. Inverse relationship, volume and pressure. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. More questions. Page two to nine. I think we did this one last time. Um, it's about the bee and butterflies. We did that. Number three. We said, what would be the likely result if all bees and butterflies in the area were destroyed? We did that last week. Bears will have more food, more plants would be produced, more flies will produce, fewer plant seeds will be produced. We did that last year. I think that's D, we had D, right? So we'll skip that one. Okay, page 232. 232. Think about number 12. A closed container of hydrogen gas is warmed from 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. If the volume remains the same, what will happen to the pressure in the container? A, it will remain the same. B, it will decrease. C, it will fluctuate and then D, it would increase. D. D. Okay, let's go back and analyze and see. So it says that, I mean, so here the temperature is changing, right? So 20 to 25, so the temperature is changing. Our volume is constant, right? So what happens to the pressure? Constant volume, increased temperature. So if you increase temperature, the pressure would also increase, right? Correct. So this is whose law? Whose law would this be? Charles? Gay-Lussac's law. 
right? This was with Gay Sachs law. Uh -huh. Because the volume is constant, right? It's volume constant, but temperature has increased. So that's Gay Lussac. Charles law will be constant um, at the constant pressure. Then the volume would vary at the uh, vary directly as the temperature. Okay. Uh, let's see. Page two thirty seven. Two thirty seven. So that's a diagram on the waves. Number 31. So you see the diagram shows four different waves traveling along the same path. Which of these waves have the same wavelength? And then the first one says A and B, and then B is A and C. C is B, D, B and D, and then D is C and D. A and B. A and B. Yes, I agree. A and B. Everybody agrees with that one. If you look at the diagram, one complete cycle of A co coincides with the cycle of B. You agree with A, B? A and B? Yes. Okay. Okay, page 239, number 42. So this, say in the diagram, a ray of light travels from air to glass. Okay. And the question says, which of these measuring instruments is needed to find the, refractive, the index of refraction of the glass? And they gave you ruler, B, protractor, C, balance, and D, thermometer. I gave this example already. Yeah. So you get, that's good. you're trying to find the Snellings. You're applying the Snellings law here. So you measure angles. In fact, your index measures angles, right? So you need a protractor, as I said before. Yeah, it's B. Yeah, so B. All right, so pay 240, something on the food. Web. Which page? Two four zero. Two forty. So study the food web carefully, and then we'll answer forty eight to fifty. Okay, number 48. See, the correct order of food chain represented in this diagram is A, grass, rabbit, snake, and hawk. B, hawk, owl, rabbit, and vegetable. C, grass, rodent, snake, and hawk. D, grass, rodent, rabbit, and snake. So C. based on the diagram, which one is correct? C. C, okay, let's see. So I have grass going to rodent, rodent going to snake, and snake to hawk, that's correct. And so C is correct. So you just have to trace the arrow smoothly without breaking. Okay, good. Then 49, a necessary member of the ecosystem not represented in this food web is A, a producer, B, primary consumer, C, decomposer, and then D, secondary consumer. C. C, the composer, that one's not shown, even though it's an important member, correct. And then 50, if vegetables were removed from this food web, so now we're taking out vegetables, which of these results would be most probable? Most probable, it says A, the snake population would increase. B, the rodent population will die out. C, the grass would increase. And then the rabbit D, the rabbit population would decrease. 
D. Okay. So if we move vegetables, um, the rabbit population would decrease. Yeah. So you see, rabbits, the only source of food here is the vegetables. They don't have another source of food. So if you remove vegetables, the rabbit population will decrease. Okay. Okay. If you take the snake population, has other source of food. So that will not decrease. Rodent has um, that the rodent has grass to feed on. So it will not die out. Okay. So your D is correct. Rabbit population will decrease. All right, 51. Which of these temperatures would never occur? Negative zero degrees Celsius, negative 10 Kelvin. Um, 200, 20, sorry, 2,000 Fahrenheit, degree Fahrenheit. And then D, 104 degrees Celsius. Which one do you think would never occur? B. Yeah, B, you can have negative Kelvin, doesn't exist like that. Okay, good. One question on radioactivity. Number 53. Radioactivity. So try and work on that one. And then give me the answer. How much of 12 grams of radioactive isotope with a half-life of 20 years will be left after 40 years? After 40 years. B, D. D, right, so that is correct. So you're starting with, um, you have 12 grams, 12 grams and a half-life of 20 years. So it means first 20 years, half of this will be left, which is six grams. Then another 20 years, half of this will be left, so three grams. So you're gonna have 40 years, this is a total of 40 years. So you have three grams left after 40 years. So B is correct. Okay. Okay, let's see. Page 248, 248. They have a food pyramid, number 36, 36, 37, 38, based on a food pyramid. He said, what first, if any, result would you expect if a disease decreases the population of the snakes? So snake is at the top of the pyramid. So if the disease affects them, what's gonna happen? A, no change will occur. B, the number of green plants will increase. C, the number of insects will increase. And D, the number of birds will increase. D. Yeah, the number of birds will increase because the birds just below that snake. So if the snake population goes down, then the bear population would increase. So D, that's correct. 37, which are herbivores? A, green plants, B, insects, C, birds, and D, snakes. B. B, the insects are feeding directly on the green plants. So those are the herbivores. So the insects be correct. And then 38, according to this pyramid, to support 100 pounds of birds, which of the following is needed? 
you want to support 100 pounds of birds, which are following is needed. A, more than 100 pounds of insects. B, more than 100 pounds of snakes. C, less than 100 pounds of green plants. And D, 100 pounds of, in of insects. A. A, more than 100 pounds of insects. Yeah, you always need more of those below you, the level below you to survive, okay, more than that. So more than 100 pounds of insects, correct. All right, number 42. <clears throat> 42. A mixture such as mayonnaise is best described as A, a substance, B, saturated, C, a solution, and then D, an emulsion. D. D, D yeah, emulsion. See, we saw some examples of emulsions. Okay. Liquid dispersed in another liquid phase, mayonnaise. So D. Okay, let's look at 43. Which of the following terms is the SI unit of work? SI unit of work. A, joule, B, watts, C, ampere, and D, meter. The SI unit. A. A, joule. The joule is the SI unit for work done, correct. Watt is for power, ampere is for current, and then meter, that's distance, right? Okay, look at 44, 44. A woman standing at a bus stop hears a siren of an approaching ambulance. As the ambulance passes by her, she observed a shift in the frequency of the, si uh, the siren. The effect she heard is known as A, photoelectric effect, B, Doppler effect, mm -hmm. C, phase shift effect, and D, Einstein effect. B. Yeah, what, this is like a Doppler effect, Doppler effect. Okay. okay, all right, 45. Make a guess for 45. The pitch of a vibrating string depends on all of the following except A, the length of the string, B, the amplitude of vibration, C, the thickness of the string, and then D, the frequency of the vibration. B. B, that's correct. All right, um, a question I didn't think of the, um, the guitar, All right? The guitar can help you analyze this one. If you want to change the pitch, so you can tighten it, you increase the tension. You, you change the thickness of the, the, the string, you have a different pitch, you know. It's amplitude, it's what doesn't affect. Okay, let's see, do you have another one here? Page 250, page 250. Number 47, it says, as the angle of incidence of a ray of light striking a mirror increases, the angle of reflection will A, increase, B, decrease, C, remain the same, D, first increase and then remain constant. What number is this? Forty-seven. A. Yes, it's going to increase. Right? So increase, the, remember the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So if you increase it, it's going to in increase. So A is correct. Okay, look at number 49. In a food chain, an organism that feeds on green plants is also known as before it, uh, A, decomposer, B, producer, C, first order consumer, and then D, second order consumer. B, producer. Yeah, it's a first order. It's feeding immediately on the plants. So that's the first order 
consumer, the primary consumer, first order consumer. Okay, correct. All right, so you see how to analyze the questions. Okay, page 251. 251 is about separation. We didn't get to talk about separation, but I believe we should be able to do this. How to separate mixtures, either filtration or distillation and chromatography, those things, you know, you should be able to have an idea of them. So 56, <clears throat> so which of the following is not used as a means of separating mixtures? A, filtration, B, electro electrolysis, C, chromatography, and then D, distillation. Make a good choice. B. Yeah, B, electrolysis, electrolysis. We don't use electrolysis to separate mixtures, you know. And then page 252, 252. Based on the light diagram that I drew with the angles. Number 60. Number 60. So said, which of the rays in this diagram best represents the reflected ray? Then you have A is A, B is B, C is C, and then D is D. B, B. B, yeah, that's correct, because 30, 30. Yes, the angle should be the same. So angle of reflection equals angle of incidence. So 30, so 30, that's B, correct. Okay. That's good. All right, so we've seen a lot of questions on how to apply what you've learned today. Okay, um, there's another one that I want you to look at before we take a little break. Okay, go to page three thirty eight. Three three eight. We want to test ourselves on some old knowledge. Number 24, damage to the semicircular canals of the inner ear may result in A, a loss of hearing, B, an inability to distinguish between tastes, C, loss of color vision, and then D, loss of balance. Semicircular canal. D. D, correct. Remember, it's, it's associated with balancing. So the person will not be able to balance well. Loss of balance, okay, correct. 25, the production of urine by the kidney involves which of these processes? A, peristalsis and hydrolysis. B, filtration and hydrolysis. C, synthesis and reabsorption. D, filtration and reabsorption. D. D, yeah, filtration and reabsorption. Distribution reabsorption. Okay. okay, number 26, you should remember that one too. The mitotic cell division in a rose bush differs from the mitotic cell division in a snake. One difference is that in the rose bush, A, homologous chromosomes are paired, B, centrals are replicated, C, spindles fibers are produced, and then D, cell plates are synthesized. D. Yeah, cell plates, remember, only in plants. Cell plates only in plants. You talk about rose bush. So cell plates are synthesized. Cell plates are synthesized. Good job. Okay. 
Um, let me skip to number 30. In the medulla of human, uh, if the medulla of a human are damaged, which of these conditions will most likely result? A, difficulty in breathing. B, inability to remember. C, inability to control muscle movements. And then D, difficulty in saying words. A. A, yes, correct. Remember the medulla oblongata um, controls respiration and the heart rate. It's a cardiorespiratory respiratory center. So heart rate and the respiratory rate. So if it's damaged, the person has difficulty um, breathing, difficulty breathing. Okay, now let's look at 32. 32 is a table, but um, you should be able to answer that question. A table shows the specific gravity of four substances. And then substance A, the gravity is 0 0.75, B, 1.21, C, 1.8, and then D, 6.32. It says, which substance will float in water? A is A, B is B, C is C, and then D is D. Which are floating water? A, A. Yeah, A will float in water. Water has a specific gravity of one, right? It's, it's one, that's a specific gravity. Um, so anything that is less than one will float. Anything greater than one, Specific gravity of one will sink, right? That's the idea you have to use for this question. So A is 0 0.7, so that's gonna float in water. Okay. All right, so I believe, um, okay, there's one more half-life question. Maybe we can look at that. Page 343, 343. All right, look at number 44 <laughs> first, number 44. It says the following diagram shows four sealed containers partially filled with water at various temperatures. In which of these containers is the vapor pressure the greatest? And then you have A, it's at 10 degrees. B, B is at 30 degrees. C, you have 50 degrees. And then the D shows a diagram in which the temperature is 80 degrees. So which one do you think will have the greatest vapor pressure? D, 80. D, yeah, the vapor pressure depends on the temperature. Higher, temp uh, as temperature increases, pressure increases, right? Depends on temperature, so D, higher temperature. Okay. All right, order 46. 46, <laughs> Radio, uh, uh, half life question. 100 grams of a radioactive substance disintegrates to 25 grams after eight days. What is the half-life of the substance? Half-life of the substance. B, 40 days. You had four days, okay. Yeah, that's correct. So you start with 25 grams of the substance. And then after eight days, it becomes, uh, no, it's like 100 grams. The eight, uh, 100 grams is what you're starting with. And in eight days, you have 25. So let's see. So first, half-life will be 50. Next one will be 25. So if all this take eight days to get here, it means that there are two half-lives. So it is four days and four days, correct. So that's correct. So B. Okay. okay. A diagram on the wave, page 345. Three 
So the question says, which of the following arrows in the graph represent the amplitude of the wave? So you're asking about amplitude. And then A is A, B is B, C is C, and D is D. A, A. It's A, yeah, A is the amplitude. Mass one displacement from the starting position. Okay, and then look at 53. Of the following, which is not emitted during radioactive decay. A, alpha particle, B, ultraviolet rays, C, gamma particle, and then D, beta particle. Which one is not released? B. B, UV light. B. Right? Yeah, we didn't mention UV light in there, so that is not. A radioactive. Okay. okay. And then test yourself on 54. We'll make that the last one for the science. 54. See, a variety of subatomic particles are shot between two opposing charge plates, as shown in the diagram. So, which particles will not be deflected? So, which one will not be deflected? So you have the plate like this, a positive, negative, and then you pass in it through this. You say which particle will not be reflected? A, protons, B, neutrons, C, electrons, and then D, alpha particles. So no deflection. B. Yeah, B, because neutrons are neutral, no charge on them. So because they're neutral, they'll just pass through. Just go through. If it's positive, then it will attract to a negative. If it's negative, it will attract to positive. But neutral, they're neutral. So no deflection. All right, great. So I believe you've seen how to apply today's lesson to some of the questions in the book. You know. So you get a chance to practice more. You know, look for more questions like this. Okay. All right. So we'll, let's take. Uh, page 117 for the math and then try the problems. So number 35 to 40.
I believe you're able to, you, you, you have 35 done. So if X percent of 150 is equal to 12, then X is equal to A, 8, B, 12.5, C, 18, and then D, 18. A, 8, 8. 8, okay. So let's see. So it's the X percent. So here, there are two ways you can approach this question. Either use algebra approach or you can just use like arithmetic approach. So if one do the arithmetic approach, then you can say that you can use a percent proportion if that is good for you. So you can set up X percent, say X out of 100, we don't know that. It's equal to off, off is the base, right? Into the off. So 150 is the base. And then equal to that means is. 12, so that's 12. So that would be the percent proportion if you want to use that one. Okay. <laughs> so do your cross product, then you have 150X is equal to 12 times 100, and then we can divide by 150. Okay, so that you have X to be equal to and then if, if you can use a calculator, right? Multiply and divide, okay? Um, but if you don't have calculator, then you have to reduce to lowest terms, which you can do easily. <laughs> so I'll cross our zeros here, cross zeros. Then I know three can go here four times, three into 15 is five, five into itself is one, five here is two, so you have X to be equal to eight. Okay. But with your calculator, you should do that easily. Multiply 12 by 100 and divide by 150. You should get the same answer. I like to reduce things to lowest terms, you know, with our calculator. Okay. All right, good. <laughs> then 36, you have nine divided by three over eight. So if you're confused, you can write this as nine over one divided by three over eight. This is what you have, just in case you're a little bit confused. 
Okay, so this will be nine over one. Dividing fractions, you have to multiply by the reciprocal, which is eight over three. So reciprocal of the second fraction. Keep the first fraction times reciprocal of the second fraction. And then reduce to lowest terms. Three into itself is one. Three into nine is three. Nothing else to reduce, so multiply horizontally. Three times eight is 24, over one times one, which is one. So that would be your answer. So that would be D, okay. which is the same as 24, but D is 24 over one, so it's the same thing. Okay. Number 37. <clears throat> Two rectangles have the same ratio of length to width, to width. The first rectangle is six centimeters wide and then and nine centimeters long. If the second rectangle is 12 centimeters long, how wide is the second? rectangle, right? So remember, we spoke about similar objects. Okay. So I'll put this in a diagram form here, representation. Okay. So this is a first small one, and that's a big one. Okay. So you have similar rectangles. There's something that you have to remember about the ratios. The ratio of the corresponding sides should be constant, right? They have constant ratio. So you can compare the ratio of the length to the width, that's another way. You can compare length to the width and then compare the length here to the width. It's constant ratio. Or as I say, sample cons, cons, uh, compare this to that and this to that. Okay. We come with the same answer. Okay. So let's compare the length to the width ratio. Length to width. Okay. So the length here is nine. So nine to the width here, she will equal to the same thing, your length, which is 12, to the width, which we don't know, x. Okay. Just have to consistent. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you do your cross product, 9x is equal to, 12 times six, divide by nine, divide by nine. So your X will be equal to, um, it multiply six by 12 and divide by nine, or you can reduce to lowest terms. So I know three can go here is two times three here is three, three here is one, three into 12 is four. So we have eight. So it's eight centimeters. So you're gonna get A as your answer. A as the answer. So remember similar triangles, it's, it's similar rectangles and similar triangles. Okay, same thing. You know, as I said, somebody else can do the corresponding, somebody can say the ratio of this small length here to the length over here, you come up with the same answer. So nine to 12, if you do that, then you compare the same ratio, which is the small width, which is six, to the longer width here, which is X. If you set this up, you come with the same answer. Cross product and divide by nine, divide by nine, same answer. You end up with X equal to eight. You just have to be consistent. Okay. All right, so let me know what you get for 38. Two angles of parallelogram measure 60 each. How large is each of the remaining two angles? So you have a parallelogram, that means opposite sides are Parallel, that's parallelogram, opposite sides parallel. This side 
prior to that side? I have 120. 120. Okay, all right, that's correct. 120. So remember that the sum of all the angles in a parallelogram, see this is a quadrilateral. So the total sum is 360, right? 360 degrees in all. And in a parallelogram, the opposite angles are equal. So if this is 60, we expect the other side to be 60. Then this, we don't know this, this is X, we expect this also to be X. You know, those are properties of parallelogram. Okay. So we have x plus x, that would be 2x. So x plus x plus 60 plus 60 should be equal to 360. Total 360. So 2x plus 120 is equal to 360. So your 2x will be equal to 360 minus 120, which is 240, and divide by 2. So x will be equal to 120. All right. In other words, add the 60 to your 60, subtract from 360, and whatever you have, split into two parts, divide by two. That's what algebra here means. Okay, 120. Another way to look at this is to think about the fact that if this is 360, then angles on the same side on the same side, what we call the same side angle, should add up to 180 degrees here. This also add up 180 degrees. Good. In the parallel, angles on the same side are supplementary. That's another way you can look at this. So this should add up to one. So instead of using one down the 360, 60 plus eight, X here should be 180. So if this is 60, that means the 180 minus 60. And then I'll give you the same 120. Okay. So that's supplementary angles on the same side. Okay, good. If you have a question, please stop us so that we can discuss. All right, 39. So what percent of 75 is five? What percent of 75 is five? So think of the percent proportion. If you're stuck, use that. So what percent, identify the is and the off, the part and whole, right? So what percent, we don't know the percentage, so this will be X out of 100, we don't know that, but we know the is and off, off something, off is the base of 75, so that should be your base, is, that means portion, is, so it means that the part goes here, yeah. so 5 over 75 is equal to X over 100, and then you can solve the proportion. So cross product, 75 X is equal to five times 100 divided by 75 divided by 75. So your X will be equal to, then you can multiply five by 100 and divide by 75 if you're using your calculator. If not, then we can use lowest terms. So lowest terms, that means that five can go here one time. Five here will be, that is one, five, that's 15. Five again will be three. Five here will be 20. So you have 20 over 3%, which is the same as, that would be 6.67%. So 6.67%, because it could be 6.6666. We run to two decimal places 
as in the answer them B. So percent proportion can help you a lot well, you know, to do a lot of programs. Okay, what are 40? Area of a triangle. So area of a triangle, remember it's half base times height. So A is equal to one half BH. So you've been given the base and you're given the height. So the area will be one half times the base, which is 10, times the height, which is five. Okay. And then we can reduce half of 10 is five. So five times five, so that'll be 25 centimeters squared area unit squared, so it's a centimeter squared. Okay. Right, so this is number 40. Any questions so far on this one? So we move on to the other page. We'll try more questions on another page. So it goes to the question, but like almost like repetition of the concepts with the math. Okay. Okay. All right, so you turn to page one, 118. Let's try number one through five. 118, one through five. So I believe you should to do the problems on that page easily. So maybe we can skip some. Okay, number one, <clears throat> what do you answer do you get for number one? How many two and a quarter fluid ounce bottles can be filled from a bottle that contains nine fluid ounces? D. D, all right, so which operation do you use? Which I operation? Use nine, I use nine divided by two one fourth. Okay, so nine divided by 2 correct. Because you have you have this ounces and you're breaking it down into these small, small parts, two, two one fourth parts. Right. So since you're breaking down, we have to divide the big into down the parts into the whole. Okay, correct. So that is a good step. All right. So as we said, to divide two fractions make sure you have, it. we want it's a mixed number, so you have to be in proper fraction. So to nine over one divided by, this is two times four is eight plus one. So that's nine over four. 
<clears throat> keep the first fraction, nine over one, turn to multiplication and reciprocal of the second fraction. So that'll be four over nine. If you reduce the lowest terms, now we cross out, you have four over one, which is four. So, correct. <laughs> okay. So maybe we could do number two. Um, number two, remember addition of fractions, you need the LCD. We're adding two fractions, LCD. Number two, I have A. You got A, okay. So, so LCD here will be 12. So you're gonna write each one with LCD of 12. So this is four times three gives us 12. So I have to multiply this also by three, so I'll get nine. This is times two to get 12. So I multiply five by two. So that was, this would be 10. So if written each fraction with LCD, now we can add them up. One plus two, that is three whole number. Nine plus 10, that is 19 over the LCD. Sure. But this is an improper fraction. So we have to change to a mixed number. So I'm gonna divide 12 into the 19 12 into 19, that's one, 12. If I multiply, remain that's seven. So this is one whole number, seven over 12 parts left, okay? So we're gonna add a one to the three so that that becomes four whole numbers and then seven out of 12, okay? So your answer A is correct. I hope everybody's okay with this question. Okay. All right, so number three, I believe you should to do number three. Number four, you should be able to do that as well. Uh, number five, you should also to be able to do that. You know, fraction, dividing fractions again. Yeah. Um, does anybody have a question on dividing fractions? So I believe you, should, you are fine with that. Okay, so let's skip to number six. Let's work on number six. So this is a typical nursing medication question. <laughs> the tablet contains 2.25 grains of aspirin. If a patient takes two tablets every four hours, how many grains of aspirin will be taken in 24 hours? I have D. D. 27, 27 grains. Okay. So one tablet contains 2.25 grains of aspirin. So the person takes two tablets every four hours. It means that each dose, the person will be given two, so times two, you have to multiply this by two to get how many the person gets per dose. Right per dose, so that will give us what four point five grains for every dose. Okay, but now you give the person every four hours, every four hours. So you have to ask yourself within the twenty-four hours, how many times are you going to give this person the medication? So twenty-four hours. So within twenty-four hours how many four hourly periods do you have there? You have to divide by four. So you divide by four, 
that means you're going to give six times in a day, right? Six times per day, 24 hours. Because you're giving every four hours. If you're giving eight hourly, then you're giving it three times in the 24 hours. 12 hourly, two times in the 24 hours, and so on. So if you're giving this dose six times in a day, that means that you have to multiply. So the total that you have to give will be 4.5 times six within 24 hours, and then that will give you your 27 grains. So there's a typical nursing question, medication problem. Okay, number seven, that should also be easy to do. So a dieter lost 2.4 pounds during the first week, 3.5 pounds second week, 2.9 pounds third week, and then 3 pounds the fourth week. What's the diet's average weekly weight loss? The weekly weight loss. Go ahead. Which one? C. C. 2.95. 2.95. Okay. All right. So here you're finding the average, right? So we said the average is you add all the numbers and divide by the number of items that you have there. Okay. So add 2.4 plus 3.5 plus 2.9 plus your 3. One zero, and then there are four items. So you divide all this by four. You can use a calculator to do that. You get a total, divide by four, and then you should get nine point two point nine five pounds per week. Okay. Okay. All right. Number number eight is again. Dividing fractions. So we have a lot of dividing fractions here. So that one should be easy again. Keep the first fraction, flip, and multiply. Second fraction, reciprocal second fraction, multiply. So number eight, you should be able to do that easily. So that will focus on number nine. So focus on number nine. Let me see. What is the maximum number of one and a half inch strip, uh, strips of tape that can be cut from 480 inches roll of tape? So try I that. C. I have C. You have C. C. All right. So let's give, um, if the others can try 30 seconds or so to figure out the operation that we have to use. 480 divided by 112. So you have 480 is the larger piece. And then you're breaking down into tiny strips. So it means you're dividing it into one and a half strips. Okay. So you keep the first fraction you can move that to a one divided by LC, oh, sorry, um, find improper fraction for this mixed number. So you have two times three, and one is two times plus one, three over two. Then you have to flip the second fraction and multiply, okay. So if you, Reduce this three, here's one. Three into 480, this would be one. You have three left. Sorry, you have one left. So that is um, six, zero. So that gives us 320. 320, okay. 
So that is C, correct? 320 strips. 320 strips. Okay. All right. So try number 10, right? Number 10 will be interesting. Number 10 is interesting. So it says an income tax system requires that persons having a net income between 10,000 and 16,000 pay a tax of 800 plus 24% of that part of income. In excess of 10,000, how much tax should be paid on an income of 12,500? Right, so think through that problem and I see how one, you can do it. B. One four one four zero zero. Okay. So what we have here, the tax a person pays is going to be say 800, so it's 800 plus 24%, if I'm, so it means 0 0.24 of the excess, excess above um, 10,000. So the person is making 12,500, uh, 12, the excess above 10,000 will be 12,500 12, minus 10,000, you got to subtract to find the excess. Okay. So to be 80, sorry, 800 plus 0 0.24 times the excess is 2,500. Okay, so this is what you have to do. You know. So multiply, you're gonna multiply this first, 0 0.24 times the 2,500. And then you're gonna add it 800 to it. So that will be 600, so 800 plus 800 plus 600, and then that will give us the $1,400, okay. correct. I believe that my loving should be easy for you. Changing three over seven to decimal. So you divide seven into three. You can easily use a calculator for that. Number 12, that should also be easy. So what's the prime number that lies between 95 and 100? So the prime number, remember, is a number that has only two factors, one in itself one in itself, right? Only two factors. <laughs> so which one would be the prime number lying between 95 and 100? You have 96, you have 97, 98, and 99. I have B, 97. Yeah, 97, 97, that's it. Nice. Oh, it's has only two factors. Ninety-seven is self. Ninety-seven is self. Good. Okay, so let's focus on number thirteen. Number thirteen. So 
if you look at them, they say a, a three ounce serving of corn beef, beef hash, supplies 145 calories. Approximately how many calories will be supplied in five ounce seven? Five ounce seven. Yeah. I have B. B. Eight. Yeah, so you can use proportion here, right? Proportion. Yes. Proportion. So you say three ounces over 155. over 155 calories. Set up the same ratio, ounces and calories. Okay. We know the, this five, this is missing X. And then do a cross product. Three X is equal to five times 155. So divide by three, divide by three. So X will be equal to, if you multiply and divide by three, or you can reduce to lowest terms if you want to. And then you should get your two, five, eight. Okay. I already tell you number 14. A jogger travels X miles each morning. Which of these equations represents the number of days needed to jog 200 miles? So every morning X miles. How long will it take to, how many days will it take to travel, to jog 200 miles? I have B. Okay, 14. Yes, it's B. Okay, because you have to divide 200 by the number of miles each day to find a day. So it's 200 over X will give you the days. Correct. Okay. Okay, number 15, I believe you should to do that. Negative, negative becomes plus. So you add the two numbers. Okay, number 16, we saw a question like that, similar. Exponents, so exponents, and you are multiplying. We said that you have to add the exponent of similar basis, right? I have B. B. Okay, so three times two, which is six. And for the Y, same base. So since you're multiplying, you add the exponent. So that'll be six. Two plus four. So that's a product root for exponent. So B, yeah, B is correct. B is correct. Okay. All right, so look at number 17. You want to factor this completely. 4a squared minus 49. I think we saw a question like this where I talk about difference of two squares. If you remember. I have D. D. Yeah, D is correct. If you can't remember, you can always work backwards. Like work from the answers and see if you can get what is needed, right? If you multiply out, you should get, but this is difference of two squares. This is a perfect square and that's a perfect square. So your perfect square, you can use what we discussed last time, different two squares. Square root of this is 2a, square root of that is two, so 2a. Square root of 49 is seven. So it's seven here and then seven there, plus and minus, plus, plus, minus. Okay. Remember we say a squared minus b squared. If you factor this, you have a minus b, a plus B. Okay, that's called a difference of two squares, pepper squares. If 
find the square roots, add and subtract. Okay. Great. All right, number 18, number 18, I think that you also should to do that too. It says, a man estimates that one fifth of his salary is spent on taxes, one fourth for rent, and one tenth for insurance. What fraction of his salary is left for other expenses and savings? Is left for other expenses and savings? I have A. A. Okay, so it means that you have to add the numbers to know how much the person, the fraction used up, right? Fraction used up. So one fifth plus one fourth plus one over 10, the total. To add this again, remember you need LCD, but then a fraction, so LCD, which is 20 for all the numbers, right? So this is times four, so this will be four. Times five to get 20, so times five. Times two to get 20, so multiply the numerator by two. So all this we get four plus five is nine plus two, so it's 11 over 20, right? So that's how much was spent together. But now I say how much remain, so how much remain, when you're doing fraction, one whole, then that's one whole number, right? So you have one whole and the portion that you've used is 11 over 20, 20 parts. So how, what's the portion left here? The part left, you're left with nine out of 20 parts. In other words, you have one minus 11 over 20, which is 20 over 20 minus 11 over 20. And that gives you nine over 20, right? So quickly, you can just look at the, parts, you have 20 parts. If you use 11 out of 20, you have nine parts left. That's what this means. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I believe we should be able to, um, if you look at number 20, let, let's, I think the other ones you were to do them, the percentage, very similar, percent proportion. Number 24 is similar to the parallelogram. That's what it works. Now it's a diagram. So you should be able to do that uh, yourself too. Um, let's let's see if we can round up here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's pause, let's pause here. Um, we'll, we'll continue, um, we'll do the test next, next week. And then we'll discuss uh, more. We'll go through the math problems and the science problems. Um, okay. So do you have?